In September 2014, when the U.S. government has begun airstrikes against the Islamic State in the territory of Syria, the U.S. government claimed that its military actions were in accordance with Article 51 of the U.N. Charter. So the question we need to answer is whether or not the U.S. claim is justified. In this clip, I'd like to talk about five different aspects of Article 51 of the U.N. Charter so that you can apply those aspects to the analysis of a particular scenario. First of all, the most important element of Article 51 is the requirement of an armed attack. According to Article 51, a state can resort to self-defense if an armed attack occurs. And there must be thousands of academic articles on the interpretation of these terms only. So here I'd like to highlight four different segments of the debate concerning the, the requirement of an armed attack. First of all, what is supposed to be the target or object of an armed attack? In principle, the target or the object of an armed attack is supposed to be a state territorial domain. This includes not only the territory per se, but also the territorial sea and warships as well. Second, what kind of scale of military actions are we talking about? Does one sniper shot already constitute a armed attack for the purpose of Article 51? Well, according to the International Court of Justice uh, judgment in Nicaragua, the armed attack is supposed to be the most grave forms of the use of force. So this means that there is a gap between the military actions that would violate the principle of the non-use of force and military actions that would constitute uh, an armed attack for the purpose of self-defense. The latter category of military actions is supposed to be much more grave than other forms of military actions. Third, one of the most controversial aspects of Article 51 is who can carry out, uh, who can be a perpetrator of an armed attack? Does it have to be done by a state or can it be also done by um, non-state armed groups and terrorist groups such as Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State? Well, according to the International Court of Justice Advisory Opinion in 2004 on the legal consequence of a construction of war in the occupied Palestinian territory, the armed attack is supposed to be by one state against another state. So this passage illustrates the interstate understanding about the notion of the concept of the armed attack. But if you look at, for instance, the 2001 US-led military actions in Afghanistan, that military action was uh, taken against the act of the terrorist groups. And the act of terrorist groups were, was not attributable to the government of Afghanistan. Despite that, the UN Security Council has adopted resolutions 19, uh, 1368 and 1373 in September, September 2001 and in these resolutions, Security Council has recognized self-defense. Therefore, I have to say opinions are still divided as to whether or not non-state uh, armed groups or terrorist groups could also be a perpetrator of an armed attack for the purpose of self-defense. Finally, if you, if you look at the prohibition, Article 51 says, if an armed attack occurs, as opposed to has occurred. These, these terms already indicate that self-defense is possible against an armed attack which is imminent. So moving on to the second segment of Article 51, it says um, it allows not only individual uh, self-defense but also collective self-defense. So what do you mean by collective self-defense? Well, let's look at the Nicaragua case, which is one of the most important cases in international law. So from the end of 1970s to, to the beginning of 90, 90, 1980s, 
the U.S. government was providing the financial and military support to the Contras, which were armed, uh, armed, uh, armed groups in the territory of Nicaragua, against the leftist government at the time. And in its 1986 judgment, the International Court of Justice um, affirmed that U.S. Uh, uh, military support to the Contra constituted a violation of the principle of the no, no use of force. But the U.S. government claimed that while it was acting in collective self-defense, in order to help El Salvador and to other states in the Caribbean. So according to the United States government, Nicaragua government was providing arms to the guerrilla groups in the territory of, of El Salvador. So, um, according to the U.S. claim, U.S. was acting in collective self-defense in order to assist El Salvador, which was supposed to be the victim of an armed attack. But International Court of Justice uh, uh, did not accept the U.S. Uh, claim saying that the, the military support provided by Nicaraguan government, even if it, it actually took place, did not amount to an armed attack for the purpose of self-defense. And also, International Court of Justice said that there had to be a valid request from the victim state in order to invoke collective self-defense. And in this case, there was no valid request from the El Salvador before the U.S. government started providing arms to the Contras. So the Nicaragua case is important not only to understand the concept of, the self, uh, of collective self-defense, but to understand the very high threshold set by the International Court of Justice in determining what would constitute an armed attack. And if you look at the wording of Article 51, it says inherent right of self-defense. These terms suggest that the UN Charter did not newly create the notion of self-defense. Instead, the UN Charter preserved and affirmed the concept of self-defense which already existed before the UN Charter. And this gave rise to the controversy whether or not uh, self-defense under customary international law allows wider military actions. But at least according to the Nicaraguan judgment, the requirement of an armed attack has to be present also uh, under customary international law. And, a second of, uh, and furthermore, um, under customary international law, there are at least two requirements uh, for self-defense which do not exist in, in Article 51. Those two requirements are requirements of necessity and proportionality. So necessity requires uh, oblige an intervening state to demonstrate the lack of other available means. And proportionality would mean that the military actions have to be proportionate to the purpose, object of, of military actions and the scale of damage suffered by the victim state. And if we move on to the latter part of Article 51, self-defense is supposed to be until the Security Council has taken measures necessary to maintain international peace and security. So these notions, these terms, would uh, reflect the idea of collective security. That is a topic I'm going, to talk uh, I'm going to talk about in my next clip. In essence, well, uh, in principle, the unilateral use of force, individual use of force by individual states is prohibited, and it's possible only in the case of emergencies, such as self-defense. Mm -hmm. And in principle, the situation has to be resolved by the, at, at the end by the Security Council at the level of the UN. And the reporting requirement at the end of Article 51 also reflect, uh, confirms the idea of collective self-defense, collect, uh, sorry, collective security, the, uh, so the control at the level of the UN um, uh, at the end. So idea that self-defense is only transitional until the Security Council has taken necessary measures to restore the situations. So, going back to the initial example, 
In 2014, September 2014, the U.S. government invoked not only individual self-defense but also collective self-defense in order to help、uh, assist the Iraqi government, which is supposed to be the victim of an armed attack. So think about whether or not the U.S. claim is persuasive in the light of the five segments I just explained. So, having discussed the first exception to the principle of the non-use of force, in my next clip, I'd like to talk about the second exception to the principle of the non-use of force.